Careful what you say because no, it's going to hopefully record everything. All right, so let's start with let's start with the syllabus. Okay, so this is the second semester of anatomy and physiology. Um, Ten o'clock in here, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then um, two labs again on Thursdays, either the morning lab, seven thirty, nine twenty, or one to two fifty, with Mrs. Brooks over in Miller two twelve, where you were last semester. Uh, I haven't changed any of that. Office hours are slightly different. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight and nine fifty, eight fifty five to nine thirty five. So right before this class, and then on Wednesday afternoons from two three two fifteen to three. And then Thursdays right before chapel when you guys are all mostly in lab. <laughs> um, there's Mrs. Brooks's contact information. Nope. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't Is it what now? Is it? Okay, um, we'll figure that out in a second. You have the syllabus in front of you, hopefully. It's extending from the end of last semester, and so we are actually going to be picking up with the endocrine system. We're just going to go right immediately into physiological systems and deal with the remaining seven or eight physiological systems that we have not yet dealt with. Um, so what do I want you to be able to do by the time you leave here in May? Um, it would be great if you could deal with the electrophysiology of the heart as we deal with the circulatory system. Uh, be able to deal with uh, lung function and especially gas exchange at a variety of different levels from the external environment all the way down to exchange across the cell membrane. Uh, draw the major anatomical features of the digestive system. Be able to draw, draw, describe, identify renal anatomy and identify the major renal functions and then deal with reproductive system and the reproductive endocrinology because that's really what's interesting. Class procedures are very similar to last semester. Just to highlight a few of these items, um, again, come to class, sign in, make sure that you're here on time. It's not that, were we at 8 o'clock last semester? Or were we at 10 o'clock? How come you guys had such a problem being here on time last semester at 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> now you have microbiology at 8 o'clock so you can become or you can get here on time ready to go. Um, again, six classes I'm going to remove you from the class. No one was even close to that last semester, which was good. Uh, and also, I know that there are athletes in here and people who may be associated with the music program. If you have any of those types of uh, events, hopefully you know about them already. If they line up with one of the days that we have an exam or a quiz or something like that, let me know in the labs. If you're in the morning lab and you can't make it to the morning lab, but you can do the afternoon lab, feel free just to go to that lab and vice versa. Okay? Um, again, three lecture exams. The periodic anatomy quizzes. We'll talk about that in more detail in just a second. Comprehensive final exam and also your laboratory assignments. Um, so let me deal with the laboratory assignments first. Um, there is not a new lab book for BI 213 yet. We just didn't have time over the break to produce one. Um, there are three labs that I've already developed for the first three um, lab periods of the semester. 
And you're going to get information on that from Mrs. Brooks at some point in the very near future, i.e. maybe tomorrow. Uh, and you're going to begin to work through those uh, for the first three lab sessions. The fourth lab session, which if you look on the back, the first two are histology days. And so there are 40 tissues that I want you to look at under the microscope and basically take four or five minutes just to draw it, give us a rough sketch, and kind of identify major features. For about 40 of those that you're going to go through for the first two lab periods, histology day one, histology day two. Um, on the third lab, you're going to look at a glucose tolerance test. This is a functional test of endocrine physiology. You basically are going to look at what happens to glucose levels when a large amount of glucose is ingested. Okay? Um, so those would be the first three lab periods. The fourth lab period there, the first week of February, we're actually going to begin to use the iWork system again. Now, over the break, we learned some pretty critical information that I'm not sure why I wasn't told by the vendor prior to uh, the break. But um, the iWorks LabScribe software version 2 is glitchy, which is the software that you used last semester. So they claim that version 3 has taken care of all the bugs and glitches. So at some point, Mrs. Brooks is going to um, get you upgraded to version 3 on your laptops. Hopefully, these will go a lot smoother uh, this semester. But you'll start out with those in about three weeks. You're going to actually begin to look at some heart function. We're going to dissect another frog and pull heart out of the frog and look at uh, some circulatory physiology. Um, OK, so that is the lab process. Do we have lab tomorrow? Yes, you have lab tomorrow. Your first lab, histology day, number one on January 15th. You see that there are five anatomy quizzes on the list. And yes, many of you have already noticed. Oh my god, it's only 80 questions or 80 items. This semester, the list is 391 items instead of almost 800, I think. Um, this is what you need to begin to look at, what you need to begin to review. Same drill as last semester. Rachel, you only need to sign one of them. Um, spot the name on there for me if you would be so kind. The problem with having your cell phone to your text messages in the middle of class. Okay. Any questions? Is everybody thrilled to be back on yeah. campus? When you guys are gone, it's really weird around here. It's like nobody's here, like there's just the guy in the guard shack and you just sit there alone. <laughs> and you come up here and like you can look out these windows and there's like beer just pouring in everywhere and like, 
Okay, so we can go ahead and I, I just don't understand why. Whatever. <laughs> Okay, still recording. That's a good sign, right? How are they even gonna get like the notes? Just from they're gonna see, they're seeing everything here. Oh, they can see it. And they hopefully can hear my voice. Hello, Mallory. <laughs> Hello, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna begin with the endocrine system, and I hope, I hope that. Um, <laughs> We are already aware that this is my favorite physiological system. Uh, I consider myself to be a molecular endocrinologist, and what that means is I study the molecules that help make the endocrine system work. So what exactly is the endocrine system? And you'll remember we finished up with the central nervous system, and we dealt with nervous system physiology. Now, endocrine and nervous system physiology actually, at the onset, appear to overlap significantly. And those redundancies, although there are a few redundancies in physiology, these redundancies typically aren't shadow redundancies or redundancies that lay right on top of each other. Um, so we're going to find that the endocrine system looks like the nervous system, but it really functions in a unique way to maintain homeostasis of the organism. Okay, so what exactly is the endocrine system? The endocrine system is a chemical signaling system. Now that chemical signaling system basically means that we're going to release chemicals, and these chemicals are going to affect what are called target tissues to change the physiology of those target tissues. These chemicals are going to be better known as hormones. You can see some examples of what we would call intercellular signaling, basically producing one of these hormones or molecules that goes to another target tissue or target cell to change the physiology of that cell. And in fact, there are really four main ways in which this happens. The first way is called autocrine. And hopefully in the definition or in the word autocrine, what you see is A-U-T-O, which means Self and autocrine signaling is a signaling method where the cell that releases the molecule or the chemical stimulates itself. So the molecule is released and it goes back and stimulates itself. Okay, so that would be an example of autocrine. Signal. Uh-oh. We may have to make some adjustments here in just a second. The second type of signaling is paracrine. And paracrine, P-A-R-A, -A, basically means in the same neighborhood. So a paracrine signaling system, we are going to have a cell that stimulates or releases a molecule to stimulate another cell within the same tissue. So in other words, a neighboring cell within that tissue is going to get stimulated. All right, now the third type of signaling, you actually don't see it here, but we've already talked about it in specific detail last semester. Anyone happen to know what it is? It's one of the main secretory functions of the nervous system. Neurotransmission. Okay, so neurotransmission. Basically what happens here with neurotransmission is we are releasing signaling molecules called neurotransmitters across a synaptic ga gap or synaptic cleft. So 
So we've seen examples of each of these already in uh, other systems that we've talked about. Uh, autocrine, you might have uh, release of uh, a molecule that causes a receptor to be expressed, and that molecule comes and interacts with that receptor. Paracrine, we talked about paracrine with bone physiology. We saw rank being produced by one bone cell interacting with another bone cell to produce the rank ligand or interact with the rank ligand in response to parathyroid hormone. Neurotransmission is the main function of things like muscle contraction, uh, and neuron signaling to pass signals between the central nervous system and the inner neurons. The fourth type of chemical signaling system is endocrine. And it is this type of signaling that is going to be the main function and purpose of the endocrine system, hence the namesake. Now what the endocrine system is, is it is a chemical messenger si signaling system. One tissue produces a molecule, as you can see here in the diagram on the right, or on the left rather. You have a signaling molecule that we're going to call hormones released from that signaling cell and it enters the bloodstream travels in the bloodstream, we're going to find out it goes absolutely everywhere, but it's going to target specific, specific cells within specific tissues that express a receptor that can bind to that hormone. That leads to a bunch of signaling inside of the cell, basically a molecular interaction that results in a physiological <laughs> change. So the big unifying feature here is that that signaling molecule or that hormone has to travel through the bloodstream in order to go from signaling cell to target cell. Okay, so let's begin anatomically to deal with the endocrine system. So when we say the endocrine system, it's actually a little bit strange because if you think about the other systems that we've actually talked about, all of the bones are attached to each other. All of the skeletal muscle is attached to each other. All of the nerves come off the spinal cord and are attached to each other. I mean, there's interface. It's, it's connected. The endocrine system is not the same. The endocrine system is actually going to consist of tissues, glands, in cells that we find distributed throughout the whole body. So the hypothalamus and the pituitary, these are both tissues within the endocrine system, are not physically in contact with things like the thyroid, the thymus, the adrenal glands, or the testes or ovaries. So they are actually separated. The connecting feature, again, is going to be the circulatory system, and in particular, the bloodstream. Now these tissues, glands, and cells, their main purpose is going to be to release these chemicals that we call hormones. So we release hormones into the bloodstream, and when we do that, the tissue or the cell or the gland that is producing and releasing or even just releasing the chemical, we are going to identify as the source tissue or the source gland. Okay, so this is where the chemical is being produced. Once it is released from that cell, it enters into the bloodstream and is going to begin to flow with the blood. Now, as you are probably aware, our arteries, veins, and capillaries distribute blood everywhere. In fact, our capillaries, every single cell that you have in your body, is within one to two cells of the capillary. So that means that the blood supply goes absolutely everywhere, interacts with absolutely every cell in the body. And so when these hormones enter into the bloodstream, they're going to begin to do the same thing. So just because I release a hormone from my pituitary doesn't mean that it enters the bloodstream and specifically tracks to a target tissue like the adrenal gland. It's going to circulate everywhere. 
Now, we are going to have very specific interactions that are going to occur. So this chemical signal or this hormone, once it enters into the bloodstream, it's going to interact with another cell. And this other cell is going to be what we would call at a distant location because we're entering the bloodstream, leaving that tissue, that cell behind and going someplace else inside of the organism. So I'm going to a distant location. Now the <clears throat> cell or the tissue or the structure that is at the distant location, we're going to call that the target. So a target cell or a target tissue. So you have the source that produces the hormone, releases it into the bloodstream, bloodstream circulates to our target cell or our target tissue. Now, when that chemical signal interacts with that target, what's going to result is a change in physiology. Most of the time we would say this is going to be a change in the metabolic function of the cell or the metabolism. So it alters the metabolic activity in the cell. The cell responds. Now, in order for this to be most effective, the tissue needs some specific requirements. Okay, so this target tissue has to anatomically be designed so that it can interact with these molecules. Anyone happen to know what this is? Okay, it's a tissue. Good. Does this look like an island, kind of? What? So getting back on task, does this structure here look like an island? It's sort of a distinct pinkish structure in the sea of other pink. Is there anything that you can think of that has the term island or islet? <laughs> You're looking at the pancreatic islet, or what we what would be known as, as the islets of Wanderhans. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> you knew that, right? Oh, you did say it. Yeah. So it's the pancreatic islet. This is what we would find in the pancreas. The cells that are here, there are actually five different types of cells. One of the most prominent cells that you're going to be familiar with the hormone that's produced is called the beta cell. One of these is a beta cell, or many of these are probably beta cells within the pancreatic islet, and it releases the hormone insulin. Okay? So in order for this to happen, we need a couple, a couple characteristics to be present. First of all, we need to have cells that are present that are genetically turned on to produce specific hormones. Okay, so um, things like insulin. I want insulin to be released into the bloodstream to interact with the liver and the adipose tissue and the skeletal muscle to cause uptake of the, um, uh, of the glucose from the bloodstream into those tissues. So those tissues that are metabolically active can use it. I only really want to produce insulin in the beta cell. I don't want to produce insulin, say, in the brain or other tissues. Okay? So we turn off insulin, the gene insulin, in all of these other cells. The genetics are still there, but the, 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 the program to produce the protein insulin is turned off in the brain, in the skeletal muscle. It's turned off in a lot of other places. But it's turned on in the beta cells of the pancreas. In fact, there's another uh, type of cell in the pancreas called the alpha cell that produces a hormone called glucagon, which is basically the polar opposite of insulin. And in the alpha cells, even though the gene for insulin is present, it's turned off and can't be produced. Okay, so we need a very specific cell to be able to produce a very specific hormone. And we're actually going to run into a lot of these different cell types producing very specific hormones. In addition, 
we need to be able to get that hormone that's being produced into the bloodstream. So our cells and our tissues that are endocrine in nature are very vascular. They interact with a high number of capillaries in very close context. Now, it's not just uh, good enough to be very vascular. We need special types of capillaries as well. Some of these hormones that are being produced are actually pretty good size in terms of cellular biology. Insulin is actually a good size molecule. We're talking about uh, 154 amino acids in humans. But it's a lot of amino acids that make up insulin. So if I just have a normal capillary that I'm trying to get insulin inside of, it's going to take a tremendous amount of force, pressure, and effort to push that through the capillary wall to get it into the bloodstream. So we subvert that by having these specialized capillaries. Now, if you know a little bit of German, you know that the German word for window is Fenster. And these capillaries literally have little windows or openings between the epithelial cells that make up the capillary wall. And so we call them fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrated capillaries literally means a windowed capillary. So fenster is a German word for window. My new house has fenster. My new house has windows. So these windows, these are larger openings that allow larger substances to cross into the bloodstream. So this is going to allow for the easy passage of those secreted hormones. So we have to have cells that are genetically turned on to produce the hormone, and we need this unique anatomy to large, allow these larger hormones to enter into the bloodstream, bloodstream freely. Now, we started this conversation today picking up where we left off last semester. We just had finished up the nervous system, which is also a chemical signaling system, it uses this idea of neurotransmission. The endocrine system is also a chemical signaling system, but it produces these chemicals called hormones, and there are a few other differences that we probably should identify. Now, in all reality, there are similarities as well. There are some redundancies between the nervous system and the endocrine system. In fact, I would say that the best way to state this is that the nervous system and the endocrine system complement each other's function. So complement each other in function. Now the redundancies that we have, where that overlap occurs, we actually list these molecules, these chemicals that are involved by a special name. And we sort of combine neurotransmission with hormones and we end up with neurohormones. So the overlap between the nervous system and the endocrine system, basically what I'm saying is where the nervous system acts like endocrine tissue, we call these molecules neurohormones. So neurohormones. And really what a neurohormone is, is it is a hormone that is going to be released by a neuron. And rather than crossing the synaptic gap and interacting with something like an acetylcholine receptor like we see in muscle physiology, it enters the bloodstream. 
So from the synapse, the synapse is formed with a capillary, and then the neural hormone enters directly into the bloodstream. And now we can actually have things like acetylcholine and dopamine and uh, uh, noradrenaline and, and, and uh, or norepinephrine, I should say, and epinephrine entering the bloodstream and having uh, endocrine impacts on other tissues. Is that the same thing with the neuroendocrine cells? Well, uh, we're going to talk more about neuroendocrine cells when we start to talk about the hypothalamus. Um, but yes, oxytocin, which is produced in the hypothalamus, is released from a neuron into the bloodstream in the posterior pituitary. But we'll get there. Do you have a question? So into the bloodstream from the Yep. So if I were to draw this out, if this is my bloodstream, we just have the axon and the synapse, the synaptic bulb, synapse right there with the capillary. And so rather than interacting with a receptor, that neural hormone enters directly into the bloodstream, begins to circulate just like any other hormone. Okay, so there are differences and there are similarities. We're going to begin to hopefully highlight some of those differences, begin to really look at endocrine function. Um, one of the big things that we deal with in endocrinology is what's known as hormone action. And what we mean by hormone action is what does the hormone actually do? So insulin, I've already hit on insulin. Insulin's hormone action is to cause the upregulation, I'm sorry, the uptake of glucose into the liver, adipose tissue, and skeletal muscle. That would be its hormone action. Now, how that actually happens occurs both on the uh, cellular level, the gross level, and also on the molecular level as well. So there's different parts of the whole process of hor hormone action happening at very le various levels of, of detail. What we do know about hormone action, whether it's insulin or our pituitary hormones or something like a glucocorticoid, all of these are going to be specific. So this is where it becomes pretty interesting because the nervous system, remember, goes to a specific location. Remember, we had things like motor units where we had an individual neuron interacting with a number of cell, muscle cells. And it was very specific where that individual neuron ended up. Okay? Now we have a chemical signaling system where we're releasing a hormone from a source tissue into the bloodstream, circulating that everywhere. So I could be releasing a hormone from my pituitary gland, which is at the base of my brain, and I could go and I could poke a capillary in my toe, and I could pick up the presence of that hormone in that blood in the tip of my toe because it's circulating absolutely everywhere. So the neuro, uh, I'm sorry, the nervous system is a very specific uh, response system. The hormone uh, endocrine action that we're talking about, it is specific, but it's coming from a global response. I dump insulin into the bloodstream, goes everywhere, but it causes certain target tissues to respond. That, th that means that the brain is actually interacting with insulin. And even though there's very little insulin interaction or, or results of insulin in the brain, it's still present there. So it's going to be very specific. Now, how does it become very specific? The reason that we can dump a hormone into the bloodstream, have a global distribution, but a specific response is because our target cells, they are going to be target cells because they can respond. Well, how do they respond? Well, the target cell has a receptor. All other cells do not. So these target cells, they're target cells because they have the ability to respond. Now, what is the receptor? What kind of macromolecule are we probably talking about? What confers physiology? Proteins. So these receptors are going to be proteinaceous structures. They are going to bind a hormone that we now are going to call a ligand. Whenever I bind a hormone or a ligand to a receptor, what do you think happens to the receptor? 
it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, it causes other things in the cell to happen. That receptor may actually act like an enzyme that gets turned on when it changes its shape to begin to catalyze reactions. Now you can begin to hopefully put this together that once the receptor is bound and we have these changes in that protein shape and the change, the consummate, uh, consummate change in the protein's function, we're now moving towards a change in overall cell metabolism and cellular activity. Okay? So that target cell has a receptor and other cells do not. Now, alongside of that receptor, basically what I just alluded to, the target cell is also associated with that receptor going to have some sort of mechanism to activate that hormone or to respond to that hormone. Okay? So, turn on of an enzyme, or maybe it's the increase of a gene that's being produced from the, from the genome, or it could be turning off an enzyme or other metabolic uh, molecule producing some sort of molecule, causing some sort of organelle in the cell to have some sort of response, okay? Now, why am I being so vague here? And I'm giving you turns on some sort of gene or causes some sort of metabolic change. Here's the deal. We have 40 to 50 different hormones that we know about. We've actually added a couple uh, within the last five years that we've discovered since the sequencing of the genome. Even though we have 40 or 50 different hormones, it's not 40 or 50 different cellular changes. It's not like insulin causes this specific change. What we're beginning to find out is individual hormones are causing hundreds of different types of changes in a variety of different cells. Um, estrogen alone, there's two different receptor isoforms for estrogen. Estrogen receptor alpha, estrogen receptor beta. Both of those have different functions in different cells. Then on top of that now, we also know that there are G proteins that are, or uh, proteins that are linked up, receptors linked up to G proteins that can interact with estrogen, combine estrogen. So literally estrogen and a specific estrogen like 17 beta estradiol may be able to bind to hundreds of different types of receptors in hundreds of different types of cells causing thousands and hundreds of thousands of different types of responses. Increases in body weight, decreases in, uh, or increases in bone density, increases in physical activity, increases in ovarian production, all of these things are going to be responsive to estrogen binding to a specific type of receptor in a specific type of cell. Okay? We're going to talk specifically about some of these mechanisms that actually occur when we get a little bit deeper, uh, but for now we're just we're just kind of giving that 300,000 foot view. Now to introduce you to uh, endocrine system, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit about the nomenclature. Endocrinologists are some of the laziest people on the planet. Uh, in fact, we don't really like talking about testosterone and 17-beta-estradiol and insulin in full terms. So we abbreviate everything. So many hormones have those abbreviations. So it's not adenocorticotropic hormone, it's ACTH. It's not prolactin, it's PRL. These abbreviations, you actually have a list. I'm gonna give you the address for that list. So there's a list of several hormones and their abbreviations on page 637, I believe. And it's gonna be table 17.2. 633. 633? 17.2 still, right? Okay. So when you're reading through things, um, the book does a, a pretty good job of abbreviating. If you get into the endocrine literature, everything is abbreviated. So if you need something, I have no idea what, I don't know, CRH is. We can go and look it up in that reference. Okay, so where are the endocrine glands in tissues actually located and how do we begin to categorize 
how do we begin to categorize these endocrine organs? Okay, so endocrine glands are going to be located in a variety of different places. The picture you are looking at here um, The, the big difference between males and females is in the reproductive endocrine hormones. So swap out the male reproductive genitalia and really the, the, the testicular tissue and the epididymal tissue and then the ovarian tissue in females. Everything else is the same. So from the hips up, everything else is, is, is the same. And we've actually blown up here a part of the brain or right at the base of the brain, brain just below the third ventricle, um, uh, what would be below what they call the thalamus which is going to be hypothalamus in the pituitary gland, and then this pretty weird gland called the pineal gland. Okay, so these are the locations. You need to know these locations. Um, so if I just give you a piece here of, let's say, the throat, and you're looking at the, uh, uh, the cartilage around the, uh, around the trachea, and there's a tissue on top of that, hopefully you can see the thyroid gland there. Okay, so pineal gland, hypothalamus, pituitary, thyroid, adrenal pancreas, uh, the ovaries and the testes, and then you also here have on the back side of the thyroid, the parathyroid, those two or four little spots of, of cells that produce parathyroid hormone. Okay, so get to know those locations, be able to identify them from a diagram such as this. Uh, it's probably about that time, but just to, well, I got a few more minutes, let me take some more time here. What we're actually going to do is we're going to begin with the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Now, there is no such thing as a master gland in endocrine system. But if any two organs in the endocrine system come close, it is the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And basically, these help to regulate many of the functions of other endocrine organs within an organism. So it is fair to say that the hypothalamus and the pituitary regulate much of the endocrine system. So thinking back to the picture I just had up here, we basically have now zoomed in on the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is made out of nervous system tissue. It has neurons. It also has some blood supply. We're going to look at this in more detail. Uh, the posterior portion of the pituitary gland, uh, also sometimes referred to as the neural hypothesis, is because it is associated with the neurological tissue of the hypothalamus. During embryonic development, you actually have this downward movement of neurological tissue to help uh, from the hypothalamus to help produce the posterior portion of the pituitary gland. At the same time, you actually have this upward progression of the tissue that we find in the top of the mouth beginning to form the oral cavity, descend up into the base of the brain through, um, uh, through the bones of the skull to form the anterior pituitary. So it shouldn't surprise you that even though this is more like neurological tissue in the posterior pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary gland is much more like epithelial cells. Now, because of the tissue differences and the cellular differences between the two portions of the pituitary gland, they actually function quite a bit differently, even though they're considered to be the same endocrine organ. All right, and we're going to come back to that. Uh, as we finish up today, just to give you a preview for Friday, we're going to begin with the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus's anatomy. And the hypothalamus, when you dissect it out of an organism such as a mouse, you can't see any differences. But if you get down to the molecular level and detail what is being produced in the uh, anatomy of uh, the hypothalamus, what we're going to find out is there are actually 10 different nuclei. There are 10 different organizations of neurons in the hypothalamus that do pretty specific things. 
we're going to go, we're going to at least identify those 10 nuclei by name. You can see them here in this picture. And some of their functions, things like water balance and stress and blood pressure regulation and body temperature, all coming from these different nuclei that we find in the hypothalamus. Okay, no lab book, but you are going to be, give, uh, uh, be given a new copy of lab scribe. You will be expected to come prepared with the print-offs for each of those labs prior to class. Hopefully you can get into them, read them a little bit, get an idea of what you're actually going to be doing. Will there eventually be a lab book? Not this year, but yeah, in the future. It's probably this summer. We'll, we'll write that. <laughs>